Let me ask about tuna. Yes. Well, clean or unclean? Well, there's a lot of debate about the tuna. The tuna actually does have scales, but they're very loose. Now, an ultra-Orthodox Jew, I've been told by the professors working there in, in Israel on this issue, they say an ultra-Orthodox Jew will only eat a cultured fish if the scales are very firmly attached. So they actually have breeding programs where they breed fish with 12 or 13 scales. They also won't eat them if they don't have 12 scales at least. So that's just an interesting point. So if you can just rub the scales off, that would be considered by ultra-Orthodox as something Un unclean. Although today that, that issue is very blurred and uh, is not taken as seriously as it might have been in the past. But personally, I would say being a high carnivore, it would be at a very high trophic level and have very high accumulation of environmental toxins. And that might be a reason why it could be considered unclean. So what you're saying is that there are re really three categories of fish. There are the unclean, then yes. there is this group like the tuna du dubious ones, that have yes. the sort of soft scales, and then you have yeah. the ones that have the real scales, That's right. which or, are considered to be clean. And then you have those that have no scales, like uh, catfish and uh, rockfish, which are scavengers, and they would have very high levels of accumulated toxins owing to accumulation up the food scale. Just while we're dealing with the seafoods, another delicacy around the world is, uh, you know, sea fish like mussels and lobsters and crayfish yes. and, uh, and oysters. All of these are looked upon as being, you know, the, the, the luxury of the luxury. That's right. What's your comment upon those? Well, all of those are basically filter feeders. And uh, we all know that if a red tide comes along, there you have certain microorganisms in the ocean, like the dinoflagellates, which have toxins which can be lethal. And since these are then just filtered by these organisms as food organisms, these toxins accumulate in those creatures and uh, are highly detrimental and even lethal. So warnings go out when the levels are very high, mm -hmm. but at any other stage, these toxins would be in those organisms as well, and it would be best rather not to eat them. So I think it's a very wise um, rule that these organisms should not be eaten. Let's come on to the animals now. Um, pig meat. Yes. What is, what's your comment upon the, uh, well, the pig? Well, the pig is considered unclean. Now, the pig is a scavenger. It'll eat anything that under the sun. And as a consequence, the pig has very high levels of toxins in it, number one. Plus, it is very prone to parasites. Now, today they will tell you, well, we can solve that with medication. We can get rid of the parasites and the trichinosis and the tapeworms are no longer a problem with the modern dosing techniques. But it's interesting that uh, the toxins in fish uh, in, in pigs have a, have a particular name. They're called toxins because the pigs belong to the family Sudidae. And these toxins, many people are allergic to them. So urticaria and uh, you know, skin problems, many people experience them when they eat pork. So those are other reasons why pork should perhaps be avoided. And then there's one other interesting one. The pig, being physiologically very close to the human has the capacity to harbor viruses which are pathogenic to humans. And in the past, when animals had viruses, these viruses and their dissociated diseases weren't readily passed on to humans. But they could incubate and change genetically or gain genetic change over time within a pig. So the pig acted like an incubator and then become pathogenic to humans. It's interesting that in today's age, that barrier seems to be breaking down. And with the latest bird flu that we have, where in Asia these people had a 50% chance of dying from the bird flu, we've actually skipped the transition. And we can go directly from birds to humans now. But the pig has always been a harborer of this mechanism of transmutating and making a disease available to humans. So the pig has always been a problem, either in terms of its toxins, its allergens, its uh, parasites, or its ability to harbor 
pathogenic organisms. Like How do you mice. deal with the argument that some say that uh, our pigs are fed on good, clean food and they're housed in good, clean environment, that this makes the pig clean? Nothing that you can feed a pig, no way in which you can treat it, can change the way in which a virus will get into that organism. Why is it that the medical world is now banning, for example, transplant of plants of heart valves from pigs to humans? because of the encephalitic viruses which are in that material. And encephalitis uh, is an outbreak that you had in Malaysia, for example, where many farmers got it, and it's direct from the pig to the human. And you, you cannot prevent that, even in the cleanest environments. You will not prevent that. What about the argument, though, that by cooking, you destroy these viruses and so forth, that uh, if you, as long as you cook the food well? Well, that is true. If you cook food well, then you will kill most of the bacteria or all of them, and you will get rid of the viral problem. But the organisms that live in those organisms have a metabolism as well, and they produce compounds which accumulate in those animals, and you will not get rid of those compounds. So you'll still have the secondary compounds. You know, if you look at the biblical uh, stories about clean and unclean animals, rodents, for example, they all fall into the category of uh, hares, rabbits. They're all coprophagues. That means they eat their own excreta. They have that same problem. Uh, the Bible says if one of them falls onto seed, and that seed is then uh, comes into contact with water, then that seed should not be used. It's unclean, mm -hmm. which is fascinating. Now, some years ago, they did experiments where they took plants... Uh, young seedlings, and they made extracts of the meat of clean and unclean animals and used it as a fertilizer. And it's interesting that those that received unclean extracts mm -hmm. were growth impaired. They had what they called a phytotoxic index, and they were more growth impaired than when they got extracts of clean animals. So now these compounds are often carcinogenic that you find in animal products, like the benzopyrenes and some of these are actually carcinogenic. So if these accumulate into the seed through water, then the growth could be impaired. The genetics could be altered by different activation of the gene system so that the product might not be as fit for human consumption as it might have been before. So there are very good reasons for that. It's also interesting that if an animal like that fell into an earthen vessel or into a clay oven, then those, those had to be discarded. Now the same applies there. An earthen vessel or a, a clay oven is very porous mm. and absorbs these volatile substances. If you heat that oven, those volatiles are released, come back into the food, and some of them can act as carcinogens. So... I think it's a very wise conjunction that those should be discarded. What about also the argument at the abattoirs that the uh, inspectors would be able to pick up any parasites or any worms and so forth that the animal had and they would then discard the carcass? Well, I've worked with abattoirs uh, a lot of my life. I've done a lot of research at abattoirs. We worked on antibiotic resistance and we we did a lot of work in abattoirs. I've spoken to a lot of the inspectors. These animals come through on a very fast basis and they open it up, they take slices of the liver, they look for parasites. And you'll be surprised at the level of parasitology that we find in abattoirs today. And uh, yes, most of these pass through, but there has to be a fairly high level before something is discarded for human consumption. An organism that, for example, has parasites of a low dose in the liver, the organism itself would still be used. The liver would be discarded. But what would be effect, the effect of those parasites on the organism? Plus, then you have the fact that most of the people that actually do the inspections and work with the meat all the time are also exposed to these things, and they suffer frequently from diseases like brucellosis and other uh, diseases that are transmitted from these animals to them. So, yes, interesting, but a lot of the things pass through anyway. What do you think then um, is the ideal diet that um, God would be suggesting that we have? 
Well, if you look at the, the original diet, we find it in Genesis chapter 1, where God says, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree with fruit on it, and it shall be yours for food. And then when the sin factor came in and the, the earth was cursed, God added the plants of the field, which are basically the vegetables. So the closer you can get to the ideal original diet, the closer you will be to a diet that will provide the nutrients you need, provided you have a very broad base. If you have a, a narrow, restricted diet, then you could suffer from uh, problems that you don't have all the nutrients, all the necessary amino acids, or all the necessary uh, minerals and vitamins. So a broad-based, plant-based diet would be the healthiest that you could have. And vegetarians are known to live longer, to have uh, fewer debilitating diseases and secondary diseases than non-vegetarians. I mean, science has backed this up. The World Health Organization published a whole thick extract of a World Congress on vegetarian diet versus non-vegetarian diet and showed conclusively that the vegetarian diet is definitely the healthier way to go. Well, of course, after the flood, vegetables were added. Do you think that that's an important part of our diet too? Well, before the flood, they were added. After sin, they were added. Mm -hmm. After the flood, meat Correct. was added. And, uh, well, do we, do we need meat? We don't need it if we have a variety of plants. If you had a restricted diet and you only ate one type of, of legume, for example, then you would have amino acid shortages. But if you combine grains and legumes, then you would have a complete uh, diet in terms of your protein as well. Well, it seems to me, Professor, that um, there's some very good reasons why God has asked us not to eat certain foods. Yes, I think there are. And uh, even medical science is, is giving us encouragement today to be obedient to uh, that original diet. Well, thank you very much for uh, being with us today. I, it's been most informative, and I'm sure our viewers today have learned a tremendous amount about the physiology of animals and why perhaps God, at least some reasons why God has given us this instruction. I'm not sure that we know everything about it. No, definitely not. But at least God has given us enough evidence to encourage our faith. Thank well, thank you again for joining us in our program today, Life After Life. And uh, I would want to encourage you to go back and to have confidence in God's Word. And even after all of these years, since God first created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, today we can still have confidence that the information that he gave applies even under the microscope of modern science. May God bless you as you continue to study.